Um, so to begin, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you to the wonderful Kelly Hutchinson um, from uh, Diff Victoria for giving us this opportunity to speak to people about what teachers and educators have been doing through this bizarre situation that we've had. So hi to all. Um, if the tech is working, this should be streaming. And if it's not, I'm not sure what, but um, Michelle Dennis, um, hopefully, is going to have it all fixed for us. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I work, um, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, 2020 has certainly turned out differently to what we expected. Educators in Australia and many other countries took entire curricula, pedagogy and delivery methods and reshaped them for remote learning and teaching. And they did it in a couple of weeks. Today, we're joined by five fantastic educators who are going to talk about how change was managed in their context. We'll also speak about the way teachers have used technology and social media to form amazing global staff rooms. So let me introduce you to Josh Velas, a 5 6 teacher and English learning specialist from Mal Malvern Valley Primary School in Melbourne. Michelle Dennis, the head of digital learning and innovation at Strathcona. Dr. Bernadette Mercia, I uh, hope I got that right, uh, who's teacher educator at ACU. Zena Chalich, who I met last year when we were in Sydney, who's the leader of learning technologies and founder of, one of the co-founders of Aussie Ed, a, an amazing professional learning network. And Dr. Sandy Nichol, who is also in teacher education at the University of Newcastle. So, Joshua, Josh, let's start with you. You work in a public primary school. For the sake of the audience, can you tell us the ages of the students you work with? Yeah, so we're prep to six, so uh, five to 12 or 13, give or take. Okay, so what have been the challenges? What can you tell us about what, what, how your school responded to the change to remote teaching and learning? Yeah, um, we did quite well, actually. So we're pretty proud of the way we responded. Um, obviously, everything came up, uh, came on pretty quickly. But, um, you know, our, our school kind of was forced into the digital age, which was probably it was, which was a good thing for us because we kind of wanted to go there anyway. And it just actually propelled us to, um, you know, seek out those uh, opportunities for us as, as teachers to learn about new platforms and, and digital, you know, leveraging digital technology. So um, overall, we were quite pleased with with how I guess we responded with everything um, we had to implement a, a lot of things really quickly within about a week we uh, implemented Google Classroom and Seesaw Seesaw for the junior grades of prep to two and uh, Google Classroom from three to six um, we have a small school so we're pretty agile which is good um, but you know we have to teach the students teachers and parents two brand new big platforms within about a two-week span um, so we were sending out at that time, uh, you know, like me and some other teachers were making webcasts and webinars on how to access these things from home and how the, how the students could access them and, um, and obviously how teachers could use them effectively as well. So we started off basically um, understanding that we need to keep things really simple, uh, making sure that we're using the platforms effectively, and then we kind of started to build from there. Um, so I think we, were, we set some really realistic expectations for ourselves to, to start. Um, and I think it paid off really well because we didn't have to overcomplicate things. Uh, we made a lot of changes for this remote learning, um, even though we were pretty successful for the first one. Um, wow. Some of those changes involve scheduling and how many subjects that we're doing at once. Uh, for example, last term, we were trying to fit in three subject strands in the first morning session, which was between 9 o'clock and 10.30, and that was nearly impossible. It was just too much cognitive overload for both teachers and students. So we've, we've since changed that. So it's two subjects in the middle, or sorry, in the morning with one subject at the end. So they're a bit longer. So they're more like normal class session times. Um, 
We also had a bit of an English focus, um, really like really big, especially with our five sixes uh, in first remote learning, which um, we've, we've kind of realized that um, the plate was only so big. So if you put too many things on one plate, that something had to come off. Um, and we learned that maths kind of struggled a little bit for us in that sense. So in this term around, we've turned direct, we've changed it where now we do a synchronous math lesson to start right away. Uh, so the kids are with us for, you know, the first 40 minutes at least um, in terms of uh, that synchronous learning. And then after that, it, it goes to a mix of asynchronous as well. Um, one really good thing that we did is we keep our Google Meet open all day. So instead of just trying to leave feedback and comments, which was the first two weeks were super hectic, just trying to find comments and respond to comments. And then one comment turned into 50 comments because you're just going back and forth. That all got taken away when we just realized that if we just left our Google Meet open, kids could pop in with a simple question and, and then you know pop out if they wanted to, um, which has actually turned into a, the virtual classroom, which now we have you know anywhere from 12 to 13 kids just hanging out basically in the classroom all day, which is really nice. So um, as long as I'm not in a meeting or they're not having their lunch break, that, that meeting, that meeting room is open for them to just pop in and, and kind of just chat and, and try and, and try and ask questions right away and get that immediate feedback. So, yeah. And do you find that uh, the students prefer that they find they pr respond to that better? Yeah, I, we, um, yeah. And we, we, we monitor it by the amount of comments we're getting. Prefer that they find they pr respond to that better yeah i we um yeah and we 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 monitored it by the amount of comments we were getting per assignment so how familiar people are with google classroom but when you post an assignment um you know you can get you can comment on it and kids can comment on it so i think our first i think our first week some of our assignments were getting up to 90 to 100 comments and those are questions and feedback and just mass confusion because they'd never used Google Classroom before either. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a clarity issue, teacher clarity issue on our part because we were getting used to it, um, but also students were getting used to it. And then by the second week, when we open up Google Meet for the entire thing, obviously those comments came down to five or 10 comments, uh, uh, an assignment, which is really manageable. Um, so we use that to kind of monitor how clear our assignments were and tasks, but also how available we were for the kids. Um, so it went down quite a bit. Uh, parents, um, one of the uh, comments that we've had from, I've had from other teachers have said that now there seems to be, um, while you're on all the time, parents also think that they can jump in all the time. Have you found that there's a, you know, you need to balance that, how much access teachers have to staff? Uh, we haven't had, we haven't. Uh, me particularly personally i haven't really had that problem i don't know if i think our, our community is quite understanding our um, leadership sends out tons of communication to the parent community so everything is very clear um but we have a really amazing community we have a small school and a really small community so uh, we haven't really had those issues at all um in fact if anything i'm trying to fight for the kids to come back on because their parents are helping them sometimes and i'm like no no send them to me it's my job <laughs> it's my job during the day um so um, no, I haven't had any of those issues at all, but obviously that's just my, my lens. I'm sure other, other, every, every school is very different, but our parent community has been absolutely fantastic. And we've had, um, we did a survey, obviously, I think a lot of people did the, the, the DEET survey in Victoria about remote learning and ours was quite positive. It was, it was really great. So we're, uh, as a community, we've all kind of come together and it's been really, it's been really good. It's been the best experience it could be <laughs> given what it is. Yeah, and yeah. DET, that's the, uh, DEET is the Department of Education and Training. Yeah, that's right. For those who are, yeah. Okay, can I move on to Zena and Michelle? You're both um, leaders in learning technologies at your schools. Um, and I'm imagining that you've suddenly become much busier than even you normally were. <laughs> All right, so can you speak to the immediate changes that you made in your particular schools, how they did it and how, how was it received? Um, Zena, do you want to go first? Mainly because I'm looking at that square and, <laughs> and Michelle <laughs> behind the flat. I think Michelle and I have both spoken about how exciting remote re emergency remote teaching slash learning was for us in our roles. Um, we were, you know, at the heart of the decision making. We were part of devising a plan. I think technology is one aspect that we had to focus on, but you know, in our roles, we're also experts in pedagogy and we know our people. So we knew exactly the sweet spot for learning. 
um, for communication and collaboration. So um, for us, it was nice to have a seat at the table when we were devising um, responsive plans to the emerging advice. Um, it was great to have no barriers and all resources made available to support our plan. A priority for us was having clear communication first and foremost, letting parents know when information would be sent out and from where. So ensuring all of our ITC infrastructure was up to date, our servers. We're fortunate in that we have an LMS, we use Schoolbox. So that was a source of truth for us. And then from there, we created remote learning plans, phase one, phase two, as emerging advice came out. Our priority was to continue learning, um, to maintain connection, to really value well-being of students, staff, and teachers. And then because we know our staff so well, for me, it was a matter of directing my energy and my time to the people who need it the most. And that was done through rapid upskilling. That was done through one-on-one -on -one ed tech coaching, creating how-to guides, videos, resources. So it looked a little bit different for everybody. But for us, the main priority was to make sure that we were aligned to our core values of continuous learning, well-being, and supporting um, communication between home and school. Cool. Michelle. Um, what about things at Strathcona? Well, I, I have to say we've got a very, very similar story. Um, we started planning about when um, the South Korean and Japanese schools closed. So as soon as that happened, we started going, okay, if that happened here, what will we do? Um, but being an independent school means that you can do that. You can start planning a bit earlier. Um, so we were able to test our remote learning while the kids were still on campus. And then um, our last week of term, we were able to actually run remotely because the parents were no longer feeling comfortable sending their kids to school. So that gave us a lot of freedom um, to do it in a really staged, careful way. And I think that's made a real difference. Um, it, it's it's very easy with this. There's a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, and it's very easy to kind of grab one of everything. Um, for us, it was really important to pick one or two things that we knew would work well with our community that were supported with infrastructure and tools. That, uh, we use Microsoft, so all of our students, all of our teachers are already familiar with it and so we moved to microsoft teams that doesn't mean it was like necessarily easy but um by having a really consistent idea about where we were moving how we were building it um i was really clear with everyone that i didn't want everyone selecting a whole of different new things to add to the kids but starting slowly with just um getting them onto teams getting them used to logging on and being part of the classroom, that was really important in terms of getting everyone on the same page. And then we've been able to add new and exciting things slowly as we get more familiar with the platform, um, colouring in between the lines, so to speak. So that was really important to um, start everything off with and has meant that I do think that we've got a really consistent vision amongst um, the school about what lives where and how we, how we learn. Yep. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in um, the discussions around change management, not just in schools, but in um, the general uh, business world as well, is the idea of um, wellness and, uh, you know, all of, all of those things and the importance of leadership, a business's leadership in um, whether that's done successfully or not. Um, how important do you think that... Um, the principal and leadership team are to successfully navigating uh, the changes that you've had to put in place? Either of you. I, okay, I'll yeah. jump in. Oh, okay, go um, ahead. Oh, sorry, no, go on, go on. No, no, you Josh. go. I'll go after you. Well, I was just going to say um, having the support of your principal was first and foremost is so crucial for them to have trust and confidence um, in your expertise and to value um, your input when you're scenario planning or devising plans. I think that in itself is very, very important. Um, that whole mentality that, you know, all of us is smarter than any of us, I think is really important and just flattening that hierarchical leadership group. So I think for us, it was everyone's a leader here and everyone has something valuable to say and 
we were working towards a shared goal. So I think a leader that's responsive, that's trusting, that has confidence and knows how to bring out the yeah. best in their people, I think is a leader for uncertain times like this. And I think for us, we were, like, in my personal experience, I was so grateful for my principal. Her constant question was, what do the staff need? How can I cater for their well-being? What can I do for them in order to do their job really well? And so, you know, there was, she had to trust, and in my particular context, um, my principal was school, new to our school. She dealt with a fire on our other campus, floods in another campus, and then a pandemic. So, you know, she was only at school for a couple of weeks. So for a leader to have to come in. So for me, like, um, I saw, you know, resilience. I saw grace. I saw compassion, trust, and also integrity. Like, we didn't all agree on the decisions we eventually made, but we had to trust in the collective wisdom of the group and say, you know what? It's responsive. We need to react. We need to respond in a way that's consistent and clear. And I think, you know, that's strong leadership when you're able to bring all these people together to get the job done and making it look so seamless and effortless on the outside. I think for us, you know, our parents don't see what we went through, but from the other end, they were like telling us how easy it was and how simplified it was and how comfortable and relaxed everyone was. So I think agility, resilience, responsiveness, adaptability, um, creativity, I think 100% in these uncertain times, managing resources and people um, have been a bonus for my context, yep. Josh, you wanted to jump in there? Yeah, look, I'm just, I, I'm basically going to be on the exact same page as you. Um, I I can't say enough like good things about my principal and assistant principal. They're amazing. And I actually say, I say to them all the time, because when we turned this all around, it was during a SIT meeting, which is like a leadership meeting. Um, and I remember me and the other learning specialists, we were new to the school and we were just sitting there and they were saying, well, what are we going to do? And we kind of said, well, we can, we can, we can implement Google Classroom and Seesaw. If you just give us a little bit of time, we can do it. We can set the whole thing up, no problem. And at that moment, he could have said no. Mm. Like he could have said, no, that's too much for the staff. That's too much for the parent community. That's too much. We can just post work. He could have said that. Like, and I'm sure lots of schools did, but he didn't. Like he, like he had to trust two new, two new teachers, two new lear- uh, like learning specialists coming to the school in the first six weeks to say, we can take care of this if you just give us some time. And he's like, go for it. And then it turned out to be re- like really great. And again, I, I always look back saying, and there are schools who are, you know, um, not to criticize, but they're posting work and not checking in on their kids or doing the the bare minimum. And that's fine. And that's, that's, but that's their culture and leadership style. And that's what they did decide to do. So um, I, I give them so much credit. I just remember it happened within, I would imagine about two minute span of we can do this. And he said, how much time do you need? And we said, I don't know, half a day. And he goes, go ahead. <laughs> And then we're off. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was it was pretty it was pretty incredible, and 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 it pays off to take a risk, I guess. So same like business, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but I I think most people outside education, when you said that, you said how much time do we need, and you said half a day to turn create an entirely new um, <laughs> t- teaching uh, for, um, context. Uh, I think a lot of people in business would be going, have you got it? You're kidding me? Mm-hmm. Are you serious? Yeah. Um, that was pretty um, impressive, I think. The good thing is me and the other learning specialists, we'd come from two schools that were, you know, one-to-one iPad schools that were like, I was, I've been using Google Classroom for, mm-hmm. I don't know, five or six years now. I've used Seesaw like a lot. So, and same with him. So we had a lot of prior knowledge, which was very helpful. I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't go and learn the whole thing and then teach everyone. It was, I knew exactly what we needed to do, which was really good. Uh, and our school was at really at a position where um, we were kind of like on the lower side of tech, of Digitech, I would say like some of our devices are, I, I joke and say they're from the seventies, but I mean, they're <laughs> like, they just look so big and fat and they barely turn on. So what, and again, the good thing that's come from all this is now we're investigating a one to a one to one device program for next year. So we've gone from cool. these, you know, these devices from <laughs> from the Stone Age that these that are that are heavier than some of the kids that are holding them um, to now investigating how do we make this a part of our regular pedagogy and and part of our of our school culture, which is amazing. So yeah. It's worked out really great for us, and, I, and I'm very aware that some people could be listening and saying, "Oh yeah, good for you! Like you guys have had <laughs> success. Like we've had problems as well." But I also think it comes down to a like a perfect storm of 
great leadership, uh, trustworthy people, obviously knowledge and, and, and ambitious people to do it. Um, but yeah, we were just in a great position for it all to, for it all to come together. Um, so Michelle, do you want to jump in there or do you come back later? Um, yeah, I, I have to say the other thing with this was, um, time was a big impetus. Like I, I imagine that every other um, person on this panel would pr probably um, say the same thing that um, we could see that we'd have to be there. And when you look at the way that change management um, models are set up, often they need that impetus, that um, that driving cause. Um, and I think that that was also a great help. So, um, in terms of like we were able to say we need to make this happen and uh, um, it meant that the leaders were being heard by every single teacher every single teacher knew that they'd have to be doing this in their classroom very soon so um, in some ways it's a very unusual situation in terms of management because um, I think that teachers were ready to hear it they were they knew that they'd have to pay attention yeah uh, can I go now to Bernadette and Sandy? So you both work in the um, in tertiary in the field of teacher education, um, and while um, most secondary schools had to stay open a, a bit to make um, space for the children of essential workers or children who couldn't um, learn at home, um, that wasn't the case with um, tertiary. Uh, children are older, students are older at tertiary, and so you hope they um, can take care of themselves. But a lot of people, I think, would assume that tertiary students, because of their age, are well versed in the use of technology um, for learning. Um, can, what has been your experience of this? Um, are they as good at technology as we think they are? And what have you um, put in to move to a 100% online um, context? Bernadette, do you want to start and then we'll jump over to Sandy? Yeah, well, well that's exactly what happened, um, Carolyn. Yeah, so we, we had been teaching face-to-face -face for four weeks. And so then week five arrives and suddenly it's were into online, like, so there was no lead up. And a university is a more diverse community, and like I'm a, I'm a sessional at this university as well, which puts you a little bit more isolated. So we had like no staff meetings as such to say, all right, what are we going to do? I, I was fortunate in, in one of the units, so I was um, co lecturing with a, another teacher, and that was be a most helpful thing. Um, I, I think it really reinforces the value of co-teaching in, in, a, mm. in a learning in a, a, a big environment where you've got large, reasonably large numbers of students. So we had like 80 students, let's say, with two, two leaders and that proved really helpful. I, I did interview a couple of the students from that um, unit and they said to me, our unit worked for them. But some other units didn't work. And in fact, I think quite a number of two or three um, students dropped out because um, they don't, you haven't got parents, you haven't got homeroom teachers or tutors that you get in school. To, like they're on their own. And some of them, it was just too hard to transition. Or the, the teacher, the tutor or the lecturer didn't provide quite enough support. But, and for some lecturers, they went from doing a lecture to just uh, recording a lecture. And so it became, went from synchronous to asynchronous learning. And that kind of worked. But um, I'm a lecturer myself this semester, and I've gone to synchronous lectures with 145 students. And it's working it's 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 working i'm so glad i'm doing that rather than just getting them to listen to a recording although i must say i've got one of my tutors who comes in voluntarily and 
and the week that the internet failed and I suddenly had to use my phone to connect with 145 students out there, I thought, oh, thank goodness, like you, you kind of need that extra person there. But, um, yeah, maybe I can say a bit more after Sandy's said a few things too. Okay. Um, so, Sandy, um, I, I just realised you created a really interesting multi-level activity thing. That um, So you were doing teaching and also letting your students watch what you're doing teaching and then being able to sort of unpack that. Can you um, talk us through how you set that up? Um, okay, well, welcome to my studio. This is where I actually teach from. Um, so what I, I did, I've, I've taught online for a fair bit, but not through a pandemic. So an out of um, forced situation. So for example, Newton with um, calculus, he worked that out during pandemic. So, so I went back to the basics again, and I was thinking to myself, well, what can I do to help these students? And I was teaching over 200 students across three units. And just showcase to you one, um, which is the digital technologies unit. Um, in essence, I was teaching it at university, um, the topics, um, and then I was always considering how to engage the students. So I had mini art shows, art galleries behind me, and then I would embed questions from one of the paintings I would be showcasing. So, and that's why I was trying to get, show them a bit more interaction. So I think relationships have to come first. Um, and in terms of confidence in technology, it became very apparent, which I already knew through my PhD, that we know um, this generation are ubiquitous learners and they, they can use social media really well, but they don't have the, the other sort of area of web design and so on. So I did a survey and I made it really clear to everyone, the only person that will read it is me. Um, and to, I discovered that to my, um, I, I was quite surprised, there was some that were just using an iPad to do their their degree. Well, I take my hat off to them. So so that's incredible. So um, so I sort of did a survey with them and then I just set it up um, in that way and I constantly thought of engagement. And you're right. So then I started posting on Twitter and I, contact, I was contacted by two professors in Melbourne who I'd never met, um, so David um, Zinger and Professor Asha Rayo um, from RMIT. And they started sharing stuff with me and giving me advice. So then I was using that with my uni teaching and as a community service, I had started a Facebook page where um, every day it's called um, um, Kids at Home, Dr. Sandy. And I was trying to help the kids during school holidays to have something to do. And then the pre-service teachers started joining in. So they're actually watching me teach um, a 30 minute lesson um, on Kids at Home. So it all became yeah. less work actually. And I was able to use what I was doing on Kids at Home and I was lecturing Twitter and so on. So it's quite a nice little, um, yeah, package. Because that's the thing, isn't it? Um, I mean, I don't. I know things will have changed since I did my um, education studies, and I'm sure there is much more training in digital tech now than there was then. But as you said, none of us were trained to teach during a pandemic. What I'm really interested in, um, I mean, you were doing the Dr. Sandy stuff. Your teach your pre-service teachers were able to watch you actually teaching. Now, we, not, we didn't get that sort of thing when we were going through teacher training. You had your teaching rounds, um, so you may have seen, you know, watched a few lessons. What effect do you think the current circumstances of COVID-19 are going to, and this is for all of you, have on the future of teacher training? How do you think teacher training is going to change from what we are learning now? Well, I'd like to, if you don't mind, go first. I have to say something which is really interesting. But by chance on Friday, I got my students' score. So they, they give an anonymous survey and 200 students ranked me. I got higher ranking this semester than before. So being online, I got a higher ranking. So I got my mean was 4.65 out of 5. And I think it's because of three things I have in my mind always, right? So first of all, it's always the student first, always. But then there's three things. How do I engage? How do I differentiate? And how do I include everyone? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, I, that's how I worked. And I think that's um, the way for unis to go. I think um, this is an opportunity uh, to change so much. Yeah. Um, and I think it should be embraced. 
Um, and I have hashtag, my favourite hashtag with this group of students who were very nervous and they were relying on me. For, I'm very much like a mother hen, I must admit, but they were relying on me to help them feel secure. So um, so I, I did a hashtag dive in mentality. So I was constantly just trying to reinforce with them through a relationship. And I think that's the key. So so I would show them a coffee cup and I'd sit and talk to them as if I was talking to, um, like we are over, over a cafe. Um, and the other thing is I just, I really I put a song on every um, lecture and every tutorial. They were different for every, um, so I, was, I think I was doing 10 different tutorials or whatever for the semester. And I matched the songs to what I was teaching for the day. And I had them turning up because I wanted to hear what was the song that Sandy was going to play today. <laughs> and then someone was staying back and just giving me songs. And they, so they were sharing songs. And I think that's, yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. I think it's, it's an opportunity that, that we can embrace. Yeah. Um, Michelle, do you want to jump in there? or? Yeah. Um, I, I certainly think that one thing that we've all learned is we're all beginners in this. Yeah. Um, so I am like... You know, I was born on technology practically um, and grew up with it um, and feel accustomed to it. But I'm an expert in the classroom. I'm not necessarily an expert online delivering in this manner and we're all learning it as we go. Um, that means that, like, for teacher education, I think that with, I think that being still in the coal face um, because we're still remote at the moment and... I'm in Victoria, so who knows when we'll be back in the classroom again. Um, what I know that our teachers wish that they were better prepared for was um, how to um, do that formative assessment online, how to engage online mm -hmm. um, and get um, one of the things we've found is it is a lot harder to have robust discussions online. We've learnt about other tools like Flipgrid, for example, to have those robust discussions but we're still working out how to take those kind of things and how to make sure that the learning um, happens in new and different ways we are finding there are many benefits so we are finding that students are learning independently a lot better we are finding that um, that our attendance is up we have a period mm. system um, we have got nearly a hundred percent attendance kids turning up online when they're meant to be um, so, so there are many benefits, but there are some things which are really, really hard. And what we would hope is that the teachers coming in now um, are risk risk takers. Um, we don't know what platform they'll end up being in in their school because every school's got a different platform. But that they are willing to try things, and the people who've been the most successful at this are the ones who go in there with a very student focus and are willing to um, change it up on a regular basis to find out what works and um, share it with others. Mm. Uh, I don't think the rule box book on this is finished yet. I think that um, I think that if this continues going on or we end up in an approach where we're partly online, partly offline, or go into school and go out to school, who knows? I think we need to be flexible and um, and that's going to be the most important thing I'd like to see in um, teachers coming out. I know that's something very hard to embed though. <laughs> mm. but it, I think it's something we all want. Mm. <clears throat> Zena, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I'd like to add to what um, Michelle said. I think um, there is no playbook for this and I think the, the, the greatest thing that I've loved about this is um, – Nobody ever said to me, oh, that's the way we used to do it or I've done that before. The openness to doing something different and better with the students front and centre, I think for me that was the biggest thing that, you know, at the core of everything we do is about designing learning experiences for our students. I think front and centre as well has become the need for wellbeing and digital um, intelligence online. So we're mindful of the screen and the interactions, but I think we're a lot more mindful of what experiences we're asking them to engage in, how we're asking them to do that. I think it's brought to the front um, as well blended learning. I think before it was a luxury or it was perceived as something to do every now and then. When your only means of communication was technology. The upskilling for digital literacy skills was huge. And for me, I say literacy and numeracy and their digital literacy skills for me and in my experience. So I think that's shone the light on the importance of that. 
from an educator point of view, I mean, I was lucky. We have access, we have infrastructure. We just had to refine our process. Um, on a personal level, my concern is the digital divide and the equity. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, a teacher's only going to go work at schools where they are well resourced mm -hmm. and have the finances. You know, our greatest needs and our most vulnerable students who don't have homes where they are they are safe at do they miss out like how do we bring them along and how do we capture them mm -hmm. and i think that's a real challenge for um some of us in schools who don't have infrastructure it support or even you know um supervision of children at home i think that self-paced student-directed learning trusting their kids to take ownership that's great if you know they're safe and they're happy homes you know they're resilient they've got support networks but like you were just saying there was um students in high in at uni level that didn't have that support network and weren't mm -hmm. able to cope so for me that moral dilemma is how do we bring everyone along and bring everyone forward and raise the bar for every child not just those in our care at school there's a um, first year teacher that many of us know emma yeah i think can i say something yeah of course Yeah, I was just going to say, like, at, at the uni level, like, I think there becomes a bit more intimacy in some aspects of it. Like, so we use Zoom and we were able to use breakout rooms with the Zoom. Mm. And and so in teaching maths through that medium, you could go into a breakout room with only four or five students and open a whiteboard in there and write and solve problems there. And I think that matched or would even exceeded the intimacy that you would have in, in a classroom. Mm. Um, and similarly, I've, I've been thinking about the lecture, like normally in a lecture you'd be up on a stage or with, a you know, 150 students. Now you're in a space with them and students ask questions and you can pose a problem and say, all right, have a think what the answer is and then either write the answer in the chat or say out the answer and then up with my stylus I can fill out what they're saying and that that's a degree of intimacy and connection that you normally wouldn't get in a lecture so I think from that point of view I also had one student say to me and he was a student who was a bit on the outside in those first four weeks of class um, he felt safer in the online environment and I thought that was fantastic and in fact he contributed way more in the remaining eight weeks of that semester than he did in the first four weeks. He was, you know, putting things in the chat and initiating different things and he, he would probably not have done that in the normal classroom. So it did suit some students more than others. Yeah. I, I was talking to um, young Emma, um, who's a first-year teacher, um, rural school, um, not a high socioeconomics, um, and she was one of her year 12. She said to her year 12, pointed out that these year 12s may have missed out some things, but they're actually going to be better prepared for tertiary than the average year 12 will be because they've had to learn some of these skills, um, which otherwise they wouldn't have done. Um, and so they, are, while they've got the guidance and support of their teachers, they're learning to be prepared for whatever comes next, which I thought was a, a really interesting um, angle. <clears throat> I've always believed that a teacher's ability to succeed at their job depends a lot on the quality of the staff room um, and that that communal support and professional conversations that just happen organically in a good staff room um, really help you to do to support your stu students the best. How important is making establishing processes to make up for losing that physical space? Uh, <laughs> Can't say them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in a secret WhatsApp chat. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay, so WhatsApp. What else do you um? What sort of other processes have you found that work to keep your teachers um, supported and having those conversations? We we engaged um, humour in our mm. staff. We had a um, shout-out board when we began. 
any positive feedback, any awesome comments from parents or any um, examples of good practice or effective practice in this, you know, emergency remote teaching phase. Um, we were high-fiving all the time. And memes, memes, the humour of memes, mm. I think they're universal. You don't have to say anything. And we, you know, we called it, you know, thriving during COVID one meme at a time. Mm. And so that friendly banter and exchange and that genuine feeling of, you know what, nobody is experiencing what we are was huge. Personally, for me, my Aussie Ed tribe, that for me was respite. And I, can, I could go there for five minutes for respite. I could go in there for re-energization. So that gave me my strength and my resilience. And I, I was optimistic and confident, so I didn't have my freak out with my staff. I was quite cool and calm and collected. But having the collective wisdom of my global PLN, people who had gone before us mm. people who were there with us sharing of resources and you know those those little questions like you know if my principal asked me a question I w I'd say look I'd get back to you and just putting a tweet out there and getting you know 50 60 different perspectives from people is very reassuring and that intimacy and connection was a lot more than um you know a cup of tea in a staff room or googling something so for me I really really relied on the wisdom of my global PLN mm. Yeah, I, I did too, you know, like, yeah, like as soon as I knew we were taking maps online, I got onto Michelle Epstein and she sent me these fantastic resources and, you know, like now I've got virtual rods and I've got virtual... That's um, so cool. Every, virtual, every manipulative that you could think of for maps is a virtual equivalent and, you know, she sent me problems that students could use and, and you only have to put a call out you know, into some of these networks and say, oh, I need something for this and you've got it, haven't you? Like it's, yeah, there's so many people out there to be supportive, yeah. I'd just like to add too, um, MRIs are telling us now that if we um, are giving and supportive of, of other people, we actually have um, more happy happier hormones going in our brain. So yeah. I started Facebook um, The Kids at Home because I was conscious of, um, my community and that great divide that Zena talked about because I, I'm very aware where I teach, as in the schools, because I do teach at the primary schools here, um, there are a lot of families that don't have the access to technology um, and that's something I was very conscious of, but most people have access to um, Facebook, even though the children couldn't join, their parents joined. And I found, I found a little community developing, so little comments in Facebook, all those things, they're all little subtle things, but by helping each other and moving forward with each other, an open arms approach I think it really I think it's really powerful so mm -hmm. um, and, yeah I think giving and I think that's one of the things that as uh, one of the strengths of teachers is that giving way um, and I've always believed in um, Maslow before blooms uh, in terms of uh, you can't teach a child in the classroom if they're not ready to be taught because they've got problems other things are distracting them so um, and I just think yeah like, for me like social media Twitter was amazing. Like the amount of things I've, I've picked up from people and advice I've been given, I don't think I would have ever gotten that much advice and not because people weren't interested. I just think we just want to help each other out because we're all conscious mm. of that stress for all of us. Mm. Josh, you've been quiet for a while. Um, yeah, no, I was gonna, I was gonna come in right after. I, I again, I think we're all on the same page here. But I, I know that because we were teaching staff how to use Google Classroom, we actually made a teacher Google Classroom, and that was kind of like our way of um, not only learning how to do it while, you, like, learn how to post and stuff, but also it was our well-being page. And you know, we could just post stuff about. Uh, we have a well-being leader, and she always post prompts and things like that to get us going. But it was kind of like a two-in-one for us, mm -hmm. in that sense. And just to add to the, obviously the global PLM, because I'm I'm obviously pretty active as well. And I don't think there's ever been a time where I've asked for something and haven't gotten about ten or ten or fifteen perspectives on it. Mm -hmm. And it's been great because every time, particularly at the start of remote learning, one of the first things I was asking for is, you know, does anyone have any? like what you learned list or like effective practices and remote learning right away. And there was, t there was obviously lots of schools abroad who had already been doing it for many weeks before us. And they just free, really free willingly just sent me tons and tons of stuff. And we use that as a benchmark for our school, but we used it as, you know, comparative models and we use it to build our model and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's, it's always super helpful. And I think that um, if people ever ask me like, why do you, why are you on Twitter all the time? It's because I can make a call out for basically any kind of research and teachers are so giving that they'll help you with like, they're so free to share. We're so, we're such a unique industry where 
Um, you know, for, for the most part, it's not like about profit <laughs> bottom lines or anything like that. It's about helping yeah. someone else before you uh, at all at all times. So, I mean, I'll, I'll share anything. I don't care. I don't, I don't care if my name's on it or not, but I'll share anything I've done because if it's going to help a student or a teacher somewhere or a school, then take it. Like, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. So, um, and I think most teachers are like that. And that's, yeah. that's, that's the amazing part of it. So I had samples and samples of work pro of, uh, unit plans and schedules and like even parent feedback comments that they that they synthesized and sent over just to say hey this is what you might have to look forward to and it prepared us um mm -hmm. and yeah and we looked at it again we looked at all these things over leadership meetings and we had everyone reading over and just to gain perspective and i think that's probably one of the best things you can do as a teacher is just gain that insight when you especially when you walk down the street in your same neighborhood and realize that, that school is you know completely different from your school, you start to realize pretty quick how, how, how many different ways there are to, uh, to build the same machine, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, um, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I guess one of the things that I, I've been trying to do is um, I'm also connected to a global network and they're amazing. I want to translate that kind of network into the school. Um, so when we're physically there, that's really easy. When we're online, um, but trying to make sure that that's there in such a way that no one gets left behind, that there's no clicks, um, is one of the things that I was, I've been trying to do. So things like as soon as we got everyone online, um, changing the focus from me presenting or um, tech people presenting to um, it being an open share platform. So instead of PDs where it's you will learn this, um, having every staff member share with two minutes one thing that's been working for them in the classroom lately so that um, the emphasis becomes less about the tech heroes and more about um, a, a culture of sharing. And the same with our help desk. It's a uh, online help desk that um, anyone can help each other with while it's got the techies on it and they're a big part of that it really is meant to be any voice can share and any voice can um can chime in with something that works so i've been trying to i, I think that twitter's amazing not everyone wants to get onto it so how can we take that into a school mm. Mm. Uh, the Twitter thing's interesting because I, um, <clears throat> when I tell people that teachers, everybody talks about the best um, social networks for um, communication and so and Facebook. They talk about a lot, whereas I actually am a bit more reluctant on Facebook. Uh, but when I say how active people are on Twitter, on teachers are on Twitter, people are surprised by that. Um, but I found it to be an immensely helpful. Um, platform. I have trouble keeping up. Don't get me wrong. Um, if I didn't have Toy Deck, I'd be completely lost. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is: Do you think this idea of global classroom, global staff rooms, is going to continue after this is over? And how do we make it? How do we enable it to continue? I think it creates spaces for conversations that are inviting. Um, you diversify how you engage with people. I love, and I know I'm going to keep being biased about Aussie Ed, oh, but I also love Women Ed as well. Um, but honestly, the, the thing that I love most about our platform, and when I say our, it's every single person that uses it. It's not mine or Brett's or the team's. Like people always say, you know, you lead it. And we're like, no, 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 we just shape it, condition it every now and then. But the conversations are for the people, from the people, and just the diversity. We have beginning teachers, we have academics, we have leaders, we have principals, we have, you know, researchers, ministers of education. So, mm -hmm. you know, knowledge is accessible for everybody, critique, debate. You know, we've democratised learning. Everyone can access learning at any point in time. And you're really taking, like, everything we want for our students to take risks to be self-directed. You can do that through the power of your phone, in the comfort of your home and i think that authenticity and that's that's so empowering like you schools won't give you everything you need all the time that's just mm -hmm. the reality so for a, for a teacher to be able to reach out and connect with such a diverse and global space from the you know with best pd and pjs from your hands i think that's just so powerful mm -hmm. and it's only going to get louder 
and more important, especially in remote and regional places. Yep. And especially now, like, you know, education has been disrupted. Like every single teacher this year has done something different. Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking of job interviews when they say, tell us about how you've led change or something significant you've done. <laughs> I taught in a pandemic, done, you know. <laughs> so our reference point, we've never felt more connected ever before as a profession. Mm. And the fact that we all throw our hands up and say, this is new, I've never done this before, how might we together? I think it's a game changer for education yeah. universally. And I think mm. moving forward, the collegiality that we have on a global scale is second to any other industry, mm. like second to none. I don't think anyone else mm. is going through what we are at the moment. Can I just ask you, don't want to put you on the spot, but um, for those who don't know about Aussie Ed, um, it's been going no in, <laughs> it's been going in, <laughs> when did it start? When was your first? So um, mm. our first interact, our, well, the first, it's, it's a bit interesting because Brett found out he stumbled across Aussie. He stumbled across um, Twitter chats um, in his role at a school. I won't mention names. And then he was leading a group of staff members at his school, and he got them onto Twitter. And then they started talking in the room with the chat hashtag, but it wasn't a chat at that point. And then the following week, um, a group of us from the Sydney Catholic School System, Brett and a few others, and um, we were at a Google Meet. And we were at that point in our careers where we were just so isolated and disconnected with big ideas, but just so alone in our thinking. Um, and so we got together at the Google Meet and he told us about this situation where he used a hashtag in a room with a few people. And we were like, well, what if we had that situation on a national level? We weren't thinking global. We were just thinking maybe you're not in the right room with your right staff members. What if Twitter could be your staff room? And so we came up with a topic, put out the flyers, put out our first chat, five, ten. You should have seen us. I was like, oh, my God, there's someone talking. There's someone out there. I don't know who this person is. So and then when bit was by bit, that? that was in 2014. Yes. And so we just had, we said 300 chats, but I think it's like 312. Yeah. Um, Brett and I never agree on a lot of things. But for us, it was about a safe space for conversations and being Australian and unique to our industry because you'll find, you know, a lot of American chats are sponsored or they're paid for or they're very, um, how can I, agenda-driven, not in a yeah. bad way, just very politicised. For us it was just purely for teachers, by teachers, discussing teacher stuff. And it, yeah. um, it just rolls like the, the way people want to connect. Like just yesterday I taught someone how to join a chat and she joined for the first time after five years of working. And she messaged me and said, oh, my gosh, someone replied to my tweet. And I'm like, yes, it's about that connection, you know. So, um, yeah, that's our that's our little story. We're yeah, quite I, proud of our pillion. I, I would be. Josh put out a – you guys put out a sort of um, flyer a few weeks ago that talked about the 300 – it was for the 300th episode with yeah. the numbers that of people who have connected and the number of retweets um, has been quite – astounding particularly when there are lots of people in outside of education who have a misconception that teachers don't like technology or teachers <laughs> are slow to change um they're not um and i think all of us there are people who are good at it like michelle and zena and um it people and then there are the so rest all of, of you who are learning <laughs> as we go um, <clears throat> look, I promise you, Carol, when people say to me, oh, you're good with tech, I'm like, no, no, I'm good with pedagogy and people first. The tech just makes my job easier. So when people say, oh, you're a techie, I'm like, I'm actually not. I just people, pedagogy, and then the potential of tech, yeah. but not tech for this. I mean, we've said it, it's cliche. I know yeah. I just said it again. Not tech for the sake of tech, but I yeah. think there's a perception that only ed techie people are on Twitter, but it's just people who can see the potential and have yeah. a go, take yep. risks, I think. Yeah. Okay. And, and, Sorry, with Twitter too. Like um, earlier, uh, I earlier in or last year, really, I interviewed um, a number of about six different Twitter leaders for for a book that I, I'm writing, and um, it it's a feedback sort of process. Like um, even Brett was saying, like Mark over in I forget Mark's name, but Mark over in America supported him while he set up Aussie Ed. 
and then a couple of people in Aussie Ed found that they had a particular interest in um, pre-service or beginning teachers. So they formed an, another group and primary ed chat and um, another, it, it, and that, they were on the, all the same time supported then by Aussie Ed and, and then they support others. It's a, it's a real sort of um, network of support. And, um, Sounds like Amway, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <I'm> <laughs> Yeah, we've got. A, we just got a couple of minutes. I'm well, one and a bit minutes. Um, one, the 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 thing you have found most exciting, or the thing you most want to keep when this um, pandemic is um, past, um, Michelle. Oh, um, I. At the moment, um, it feels like it will never be passed. It was really so yeah. dramatic. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that um, when this pandemic passes, we look at school in a different way. Um, yeah. I think that we um, let structures d define what school should be more than we let learning define what school should be or community. I would like the training table to disappear. Um, I think that nowadays we know that we can learn in different ways. We learn. We know that kids can um, can think in different ways, and that we can come together in both real spaces and virtual spaces. And I would like to see that not replace school because I I, I do think it's important that we're there together physically, but. I think it can open up more opportunities and make it so that um, we look at learning in a different way, that we can take a bonsai approach to school and really trim back some of the Ooh. excess. Mm. I like that. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, Bernadette, one thing. Um, I think it's the connection, like, between... Um, the educators in a sense even in the institution I work like so each week now myself and two two other people, two of my tutors who we, we meet on Zoom and we, we go through what we're doing and we chat and you know we support each other and then they're in one of the faculties I work in they have they have a sort of a team meeting once a, a week and sessions are included. Whereas in the past, um, it would only have been the full-time members of a, a university. So I think that level of connection and also the beauty of those. So One thing. <laughs> well, yeah. We've got about 30 seconds left. Um, so one thing, Josh. I was just going to say that I think that we, we keep the thing that sh that's always there even beyond is just building those relationships because I think that regardless of what situation we are, I think you'll find that the most successful teachers are the ones that had and do build great relationships mm -hmm. and the ones that are probably struggling are the ones that didn't take, don't, doesn't, don't take that time to do that. So beyond anything, it doesn't matter where you are, or where you're learning or what situation you're in or what pandemic it is. I think if you have strong relationships, you're going to be okay. So I think that's, that's the first and foremost thing that we should keep doing mm -hmm. forever mm -hmm. and ever. <laughs> Zena, one thing. Um, a priority and focus on well-being. I'd love to see that as a theme for everyone. Cool. Mm. Post-pandemic. <laughs> and finally, Sandy. I'm going to say creative thinking. Yep. So I agree with all the other ones, but um, creative thinking, this is our time to shine. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> I have to say thank you very much um, for giving us your time today. Um, thank you for all that you are doing in actually um, teaching our students. Um, and from We Teach Well, that's I'm Carolyn, and that's all for today. Again, thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>